Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure and honor to introduce one of our own. Many of you know Dr. Ross Baldessarini. Dr. Baldessarini has been a career investigator with the NIMH from 1970 to 2001. He's an internationally known research psychopharmacologist with many contributions to the actions of antipsychotic and mood altering medicines. He's trained over 160 laboratory and clinical investigators. He joined McLean in 1977 to help establish and direct the Mailman uh, Research Laboratory for Psychiatric Research. In the 1980s, he became the founding director of the Bipolar and Psychotic Disorders Program, the director of psychopharmacology, and the founder of the International Consortium for Bipolar Disorder Research. He has nearly 2,150 publications. It always gets bigger every time I read this, including chapters on psychopharmacology and the standard American textbook of pharmacology, as well as his own book, Chemotherapy and Psychiatry. He serves on editorial boards of leading neuroscience and psychiatric research journals. His international consortium, uh, or the International Consortium for Bipolar and Psychotic Disorders Research, was founded in 95 to engage in international collaborative research on the epidemiology and treatment of major psychiatric disorders. His group collaborates with colleagues and trainees in the United States, Canada, South America, Europe, and Asia. Recent studies emphasize prediction of diagnosis and, co uh, and morbid course in bipolar disorder versus major depression and critical assessments of the efficacy of treatments for these disorders. Today he's going to speak with us on mixed features and mood disorders, historical and clinical or current clinical implications. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Baldessarini. Can I be heard in the back of the room with this clip out? Not good enough? Let's do this one. Is that better? Okay. Uh, first of all, I have to say it's uh, nice to be here, uh, nice to still be here, uh, and I hope uh, I'll be able to tell you some interesting things today that uh, have grown out of uh, work that's been going on with our international collaboration uh, now for a consortium for quite a few years. We started getting interested in this topic of mixed uh, states in mood disorders uh, way back when, starting with uh, uh, some work done by a collaborator in Parma, uh, whose disciple uh, works with us now, uh, Paula Salvatore, but this is her uh, professor in Parma, uh, Carlo Magini, uh, was very interested in the mixed state phenomenon and, and translated some of the early uh, 19th century work done in Germany uh, into Italian, and then we've translated the Italian and the English uh, more recently. Uh, other folks uh, who are involved, um, I didn't have on the list here Katerina Trady, uh, who did her training in, in Paris, uh, currently works at the Beth Israel in town and is about to take a very uh, senior position at the University uh, Medical Center in Portland, Maine. And she had a lot to do with our uh, coming to understand better how uh, Kreplin wrestled with his uh, manic depressive concept and how it evolved from the 1880s through the 90s. And I'll comment on a little bit of this as we go along. And then the two major collaborators specifically on work presented today, uh, one is Leonardo Tondo, who has run a mood disorder uh, research center in Sardinia for many years and comes to McLean about a half a dozen uh, times a year uh, to work uh, with us. And then more recently, uh, Gustavo Vasquez, who uh, is uh, nominally at least uh, from uh, Argentina, but is currently on loan to Queen's University in Ontario, and led the uh, work that I'm going to show you on the epidemiology of this condition. Uh, let me get into the uh, story. Uh, a list of my sins and uh, failings are listed there and they're in the handout. Now, I wanted to start out uh, by um, raising a, a very old and for me still lively and still very painful understanding of this problem that we have in dividing up uh, major mental illnesses into some kind of rational 
subgroups. Uh, we have this problem in spades between dividing between disorders of, of thinking and logic and that sort of thing and disorders of mood and affect. And that tradition of trying to make that separation has gone on uh, even before Kriplin. It was a lively topic of discussion in Europe in the 19th century, but I think Kriplin really reified it by splitting his illnesses or his patients into manic depressives and people with dementia precox, uh, now called schizophrenia. The problem with, the, with that kind of, of dichotomy um, is that it's really based on, I think, excessive faith in what I would call archetypes rather than common clinically encountered real people. Clinically encountered real people tend to be very complicated, as you know better than I do. Uh, people we call psychotic have feelings too. Uh, people with mood disorders are sometimes pretty irrational in their thinking and in their behavior. And where you draw lines uh, between the two uh, is not easy, but we're stuck with it since Kriplin and the DSM tradition and the ICD tradition have continued and perpetuated the split between psychotic disorders and mood disorders, uh, whether it's correct or not. The fact is that many, many people fall in the middle, and that leads us to this concept of schizoaffective illness, and that's a nightmare of complexity, confusion, uh, funny use of language, and funny thinking, and damn little research. We still don't have a solid, even an epidemiology of schizoaffective illness, partly because the definition is elusive and it means different things in different places to different people, uh, let alone anything about how to treat it or how to prognosticate about it and so on. That's a big problem. Another big problem that went on over the past century since Kriplin invented his manic depressive very broad concept that included people with recurring severe melancholic depressions and people with what used to be called uh, cyclic uh, psychoses, which are really uh, what we would now call bipolar disorder, people who had ups and downs and different phases of illness over time that they, they cycled in and out of. That broad concept of manic depressive illness is something that, that Kreplin came to gradually and rather painfully. In the first few editions of his textbook, he was all over the place in trying to figure out how to subgroup, how to organize the psychotic disorders and the mood disorders. And, and in about 1895, he was just getting ready to write the fifth edition of his textbook, and he had a young guy working in his department called uh, Wilhelm Weigand. And Weigand was a very bright young guy who was eager to become an assistant professor. And in German universities, to be able to get a faculty position, you had to write another thesis. Even if you had done an MD and a PhD, you had to do what's called an habilitation thesis. And he uh, had trained at the University of Würzburg, and he did the thesis for, uh, for that university. But uh, his boss in Heidelberg, Kreplin, read it too. Uh, this is uh, himself. He's a very intimidating looking uh, character, but uh, I understand was not a, not a bad guy uh, once you got to know him. But he is a little, a little intimidating, I must say. And this was his, uh, the published version of his habilitation uh, thesis uh, project uh, on the mix uh, in manic depressive illness. And it means the mixed states in manic depressive insanity. And in the fifth edition of Kreplin's textbook was, I think, the first time that he actually introduced the concept and the term manic depressive illness. And he was, I think, deeply moved by this thesis because he ripped off page after page of it and stuck it in the textbook with appropriate footnotes. I mean, he was an honest guy, but he was obviously uh, impressed with this idea. And the idea was that <clears throat> it, took, it took the field 
farther than it had been in nearly 2,000 years. Back in about 150 AD, there was a uh, <clears throat> the son of a guy who raised horses for the Roman army uh, named Arateus, uh, who grew up in Cappadocia, which is in central Turkey currently. And he settled in uh, uh, probably mostly in Egypt, uh, maybe in Rome. It's not clear where he worked. But he wrote a very interesting short textbook of medicine. And in it, there's an even shorter uh, chapter on what we would recognize as psychiatry. And in there, he points out that he has known people who have done the things that Hippocrates used to talk about. They would get very excited, talk too fast, do too much, and so on and so on. And sometimes, and at other times, would look melancholic. And he was, he was the, probably the first to put on the map this idea that there are illnesses of mood that can go up or down in the same person at different times. Kripalan took the next very bold step uh, two millennia later, saying, hey guys, you can have both at the same time. And it sounds, when you first try to get your head wrapped around the concept, it sounds counterintuitive, it sounds a little crazy. I mean, how can you be manic and depressed at the same time? And what he meant by that is that there were elements of the opposite pole to be found in each of the polarities of the main, what happened here? There it is. This is an attempt to summarize uh, some of the ideas that are in his thesis. And <clears throat> the arrows up mean there's more of the, whatever it is, and the blue arrows down mean less of it. And obviously in pure mania, everything is up. Your uh, mood is up, your activity level is up, uh, your thinking is speeded up and so on. And in uh, melancholia or depression, uh, all three of those categories uh, were down or depressed. But he made the point that there were a number of clinical conditions that he had seen uh, that had mixtures where you might be excited, uh, talking too fast, moving around too fast, but your mood was basically depressed. And he also found uh, in, in patients who were manic or excited, <clears throat> that they may have elements of, of depressed mood creeping in. Uh, they tended to be labile, at least. They would shift from one mood state to the other. And he found that in some people who he thought were manic, uh, some elements of, of the uh, syndrome might be absent or even opposite to what you might expect. He also recognized that there were I'm going to figure out how to get the uh, pointer to work here. Well, we'll do without it. Uh, one of the uh, syndromes that he recognized was agitated depression, uh, depression with a degree of motor uh, disturbance, restlessness, uh, agitation. Um, I think that currently the the, the court of the sort of um, classic or archetypical mixed states that we recognize these days in some places uh, are agitated depression and dysphoric or mania with depressive uh, features or elements mixed in or at least alternating with the, with the mania. So th his, his basic idea was that he thought it was useful to divide up uh, human behavior into these three dimensions of mood, motor activity, and the style of thinking that was going on and that these could be either up or down in various combinations. Now, he, he became uh, re quite an enthusiast for this concept, no surprise. I mean, this was his, his baby. And in his textbook, uh, or in his thesis, he boldly claimed that he could find mixed features in nearly 70% of patients who were seen when he was in training uh, with Kreplin at the Heidelberg Clinic. That number is, uh, for me, a little high, and it certainly doesn't square with what I'm going to show you next about our findings on the epidemiology of mixed uh, conditions. But uh, it, it makes his point, at least, that there's a lot of it out there, and the closer you look and the looser your criteria are, the more of this admixture of ups and downs uh, in the same person at the same time you might see. 
My, <clears throat> my impression about one of the spin-offs of this idea, I, have, I could almost feel in reading the uh, various editions of Kreplin's textbook in the fifth with, with introducing manic depressive, you can almost feel the light bulb going on over his head. There's this flash of insight and this aha idea that it's all one big ball of wax. You know, trying to divide this into subtypes. Uh, and he, cons he considered splitting recurrent depression away from the more uh, circular or uh, bipolar groups. But he kept fighting it and kept arguing against it. And I think that this insight that the same person could be both manic and depressed, sort of, at the same time, I think really made an impression on him. And I think it's one of the factors that pushed him toward introducing this concept of uh, manic depressive illness. The problem that we've been left with is that for the past 100 years since Kreplin, there's been a battle royal going on, first in Europe and more recently in this country, about is it really a big monolithic ball of wax called manic depressive illness that includes everybody with bad feelings, or are there at least maybe two subgroups? And there's been a tendency, particularly uh, coming out of Central European and even University of Iowa traditions uh, in this country to say at least we ought to think about a bipolar group and a unipolar recurrent depressive group. And it was not until 1980 that that actually got made official in DSM-3. So it's remarkable that we've been kicking around with these subdivisions since the time of Hippocrates, and only in 1980 did we settle on this dyad. And the main point that I want to leave you with today is to leave you a little bit uncomfortable about that dyad. I understand it's written in, in stone and it's in the Bible and we're all supposed to cherish and obey uh, what it says in the Bible, but I gotta tell you there's a lot in between bipolar illness and depression. I think DSM-5, well, DSM-4 was the first to recognize a group called uh, mixed states. They took a very narrow view of the idea and they said you had to be able to meet all the basic criteria for both mania and depression at the same time. That's a little hard to do. DSM-5 loosened it up and they say if you have three or more characteristics from the opposite polarity, uh, you can say that you're in a subgroup called with mixed features. Uh, strictly speaking, DSM really wants you to have three features that are not commonly common in either state even though I think that's being a little bit demanding. And the European tradition is they're comfortable in accepting ideas like agitated depression. Even though agitation is part of mania, uh, depression, which is you know, mainly depression clinically, that has a lot of agitation in it, uh, is a recognizable sub-syndrome. And this, this notion is something that uh, another uh, friend and collaborator uh, uh, Dr. Kokopoulos, who just died of uh, cancer a couple of years ago, worked in Rome, and he, uh, for many years, pushed this idea of agitated depression being a separate and distinct category that looked different, behaved differently over time, followed its own course, and required a different kind of treatment. I'm not going to get too deeply into, into the treatment side of this because there's really not a lot to say, but I do want to inter introduce the concept that I'll come back to later. That I think one of the not so nice things that came out of DSM-3 was the concept of major depressive disorder, which it invented as kind of a political compromise between European melancholia and mostly new world uh, neurotic depression and that sort of thing. And they kind of put it together in major depressive disorder, which for me is a mess. And it's too many complicated different things to sit comfortably as one category. The other bad news about major depressive disorder is that the pharmaceutical industry got hold of it. And they invented back in the late 50s a group of new drugs called antidepressants. And they could have been called anxiolytics, it could have been called a lot of other things, but it, uh, the, the label antidepressant got stuck to them. 
And boy, did they get peddled for unhappy people of all sizes, shapes, and colors. And I think one of the problems that we're wrestling with right now is that one of the things that Kukopoulos taught us is that if you give an antidepressant to a person in an agitated, depressed state, watch out and make sure that your malpractice is paid up because they're likely to go sideways or they might even explode and become really very uh, out of control and irrational and impulsive and, and uh, so on. Anyway, these are criteria that Kukopoulos proposed should be considered <clears throat> in thinking about this group that he called agitated depression. And uh, certainly the absence of psychomotor retardation, which is an important concept because in uh, bipolar depression, um, psychomotor retardation is a classic uh, presentation. Not always, but many people are like that. Many are also are agitated, some may be psychotic. <clears throat> but particularly in, in what seems like unipolar depression, uh, re retardation absence is a clue. Being overly talkative uh, but depressed, being agitated, tense, uncomfortable, dysphoric, uh, suffering, being really in a state of psychic pain, uh, maybe having uh, crying spells, um, having thoughts that may be coming too fast. They may be dark thoughts, but they're coming rather quickly. Uh, irritability and anger are very much a part of this condition. This is another one of the reasons why, for him, antidepressants were not such a great idea, because people could really literally explode on you and, and get into trouble. And then the other thing is this concept of lability, and I think lability is really a hop, skip, and a jump away from mixed states. That is, you, you, to be mixed, you don't always necessarily have to be up and down at the same time. You can alternate rapidly, and I have spent many hours sitting in seclusion rooms uh, with nominally manic persons uh, in this hospital and, and elsewhere in the past, and I can tell you how, I, I can't count the number of people who I've seen shift from being you know, Jesus Christ uh, reincarnated or Napoleon one minute and just being miserable, hopeless, helpless, wanting to die, thought, th thinking something catastrophic is happening. Within minutes, just on and off, on and off. And that kind of liability is, again, a hallmark uh, of, of bipolarity in general. And uh, uh, Kukopoulos argued that it was commonly seen in depression with agitation. Uh, and then a particular type of insomnia, he thought, uh, trouble getting to sleep. Th these were commonly found. And he, he made a, a uh, uh, actually a scale that just got published by some of his junior colleagues in Rome this year, of uh, the Kokopoulos rating scale for mixed depression or agitated depression. And he said that if you had three out of eight of these things that you ought to be seriously considered as being possibly uh, in a mixed state. Now, another, another really nice piece of information comes from work by Joe Goldberg in New York. And this is from the, the big NIH uh, bipolar collaborative project that he was part of. And this work came out actually 2009 before DSM-5 moved to this idea of mixed features, meaning three or more characteristics of the other polarity of mood, particularly in depression. There's a lot less said about mixed mania. There's a lot of work going on with, about mixed depression. Anyway, this was like six years before, or four years before the uh, DSM-5 came out. And he counted up uh, prevalence of hypomanic symptoms in persons meeting criteria for major depressive disorder or major depressive episode in bipolar patients. These are bipolar, depressed people, count the number of hypomanic features while they are in a depression. And it turns out that if you follow that red arrow and you take three or more and you add up all those little green bits, you come up with a total of about 25% of people in bipolar depression seem to have mixed features. And if you follow the DSM-5 criteria, that's where they are. Turns out in the epidemiology 
uh, which I'm coming to next, that number fits very nicely what we have found in uh, reviewing many studies of uh, the prevalence and so on. This is a, a messy slide, and I, I draw your attention to the bottom two lines. This is a review that we did this past year, just, just came out in the uh, Journal of Affective Disorders, led by our, our friend uh, uh, Gustavo Vasquez from, uh, from Ontario. And we found <clears throat> a, a total of 17 studies, <clears throat> and then on the bottom line, we added some of our own new data just to uh, complete the picture. And what you find overall is that the prevalence of mixed states in bipolar mania, bipolar depression, or in unipolar depression averages right around 20, 21%. There are differences <clears throat> in the subgroups, however. The highest rate on average was about 35% with mixed features in bipolar mania or hypomania. That's in bipolar one, bipolar two can do it and 32%, about the same, a little less, in bipolar depression. Main point being that the two bipolar groups are much higher, well, much, 10, 15% higher than in unipolar depression with mixed features at only about 20, 21%. And <clears throat> this number, bipolar depression, 32% is not too different from the 25% that I showed you in Joe Goldberg's uh, study in the previous slide. So that's sort of where we are with the epidemiology. But before I leave this, I do want to be able to uh, make you more uncomfortable by pointing out that the numbers vary quite considerably. Uh, particularly in the unipolar depression, you go all the way from, uh, what, eight, eight or nine percent up to 40 some percent. So there's a lot of variability and a lot of the problem has to do with definitions and the way people apply definitions. And th this is still very much an art form. It's not a, you know, this is not rocket science yet. Uh, maybe it'll become that. And then to uh, show you again comparisons, the uh, blue data are from this Vasquez uh, review that you just saw. The green data are from a new study that um, we hope uh, will be accepted this week in a European journal. Uh, involving 3,100, 3,100 bipolar and unipolar patients from the Sardinia Clinic uh, led by uh, Dr. Tondo. And I, the gist of this is that the numbers are remarkably similar. And that similar, similarity helps me to sleep a little better at night, meaning that the uh, numbers that we've come up with, I think, are not totally off the wall. They seem to be reasonably consistent and reproducible. And again, you find uh, highest rates are in bipolar mania, also high in bipolar depression. And if you compare bipolar overall to unipolar, uh, bipolar seems to have this mixing quite commonly. And wh while I'm on that, that should be no surprise <clears throat> because the, the bipolar syndrome contains a lot of the elements that we end up calling mixed states. I mean, these are people with complicated mood states, complicated behavioral states. That's kind of their thing. I mean, they, they are that way. Unipolar depression tends to be a bit more stereotyped and, and slightly simpler. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, mixing seems to be more likely in, in bipolar patients. Whoops. Yeah, this is a um, complicated but I think fascinating summary of things that came out of this 3,100 patient review that we just finished. And <clears throat> it, these are ratios, and I'm not going to bother you with a lot of statistics. You're going to have to trust me that all of these differences are statistically significant. And I picked only ones that I thought were particularly interesting to make uh, into this slide. And it is the ratio of the likelihood of a particular feature being found in a mood disorder person in a mix, with mixed states or not. So it's mixed to non-mixed ratios. And the bigger the ratio, the more likely you're going to see it in mixed state persons. You'll notice that there are some of these factors that are actually less likely in persons with mixed states, and they're among the most interesting findings. 
uh, among positive findings, more likely in mixed day people, more likely to be unmarried or separated, uh, unemployed, their parents early in their lives were more likely to have separated or to have had, or actually to have died is the other difference. Slightly more likely in women than in men. They actually had fewer siblings. Uh, they were less likely ever to have married, and they had few, fewer children. So their fertility rates are somewhat lower. That's interesting. Now, again, not entirely surprising. Other things that you'll see over here on the clinical side, uh, the biggest difference is if you look at other episodes in the same persons, those who presented initially in a mixed uh, condition tend to have similar mixed conditions over and over again. So it, it's something that almost begins to look as if it sort of runs true in a particular patient. So it, it gets me thinking that mixed phenomena are not just a kind of a ho-hum, isn't that interesting quirk in this particular episode. It's like a, think of it maybe as like a sub-syndrome. There's a repetitious, predictable quality to it, and that makes it fascinating. Um, other mixed episodes, very uh, 15 times more likely if you present initially in a mixed condition. Much more substance abuse, three, four times greater risk of substance abuse. In the bipolar people who undergo switching, they are much more likely to switch into a mixed state than into a pure mania or hypomania. They're much more likely to be, uh, you know, more than three times more likely to attempt suicide, and that's a very big deal. And we've recently gone back and looked at the uh, unipolars and the bipolars separately, and the likelihood of substance abuse and suicidal behavior are similar in both bipolar and unipolar. So this seems to be, again, a fairly general set of findings. Um, people who start out in life with depression, 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 and then later on show their first uh, Mania, that's much more likely in people who present sometimes in mixed states. So again, the connection with bipolarity uh, comes up again. Um, bipolar, again, being more commonly uh, with mixed conditions than unipolar depression. Familial history is fascinating. Uh, much more, well, generally, family histories are very high, in, especially in bipolar patients. But in people with mixed states, you're more likely to find first degree relatives with bipolar disorder, with suicide. So there, there's some things that are looking a little biological that are quite, I think, quite interesting in the family story. The other finding is that it's not a big deal, but the, uh, in general, uh, over time, prospectively followed over four or five years, people with mixed conditions tend to be sicker on average over time. They spend a higher proportion of weeks in follow-up ill rather than well. Um, onset age is considerably significantly younger in people who have mixed states. The, uh, this part C is uh, kind of inside uh, baseball. It's um, looking at various rating scales that have been applied, and these are they're, they're of interest, but they're, they're a little on the esoteric side. It turns out if you look at uh, item five of the uh, YMRS uh, mania scale, young mania scale, that <clears throat> irritability, item five, is much, much more likely in people with mixed states. And this isn't necessarily while they're in the state. These are, this is testing this done when they enter the clinic, and they're in a variety of clinical conditions then. Some are depressed, some are well, and so on. So irritability, very high. Uh, the Hamilton item nine agitation, considerably higher, almost three times more likely among people with mixed states at other times. So again, you begin to wonder whether these are almost characteristic of the person, these tendencies toward agitation and irritability. It may not necessarily just be in the acute episode. Um, in persons who are depressed, if you look at the total YMRS, it's again almost three times higher score. It's a small numbers, 
but the numbers are from going from a low of near zero to something, uh, three times more uh, in persons with mixed conditions. We've also looked at the uh, uh, Haga uh TEMPS A rating uh, system for assessing affective temperaments. And there are basically five. Uh, there's uh, anxious, dysphoric or depressive, hyperthymic, irritable, anxious, did I hit five? Anyway, if you go through people who have been uh, tested and evaluated with the TEMPS system, it turns out that there's a much, much higher likely an irritable temperament. So again, it raises this question, is, is this something characteristic of the people who become mixed that they carry around all the time? Um, and you can look at uh, Hamilton item three for suicidal thinking, and again, that's significantly elevated in people who go on to have mixed uh, states. Not a great surprise. Now, the next thing I, I feel obligated to turn to as a card-carrying pharmacologist is all very interesting stuff you've been telling us, but so what? Like, so what to a clinician means, what do I do about it? And again, I have to echo what Kakopoulos tried to teach us. And in Kakopoulos' own clinic when he was alive, and this is where Tondo trained and picked up a lot of his habits, they had this idea, the standard policy in the clinic was that what we call antidepressant drugs should first and foremost be considered psychotoxins for persons with mood disorders. And he's been preaching that gospel for several decades, uh, even before it be, has begun to become uh, a popular idea. The idea is that people who have undiagnosed bipolar disorder, people who have are prone to these mixed uh, conditions, don't do well with antidepressants. Many of them get clinically worse. And sometimes you don't really know what you're dealing with because they may become more angry, more irritable, more dysphoric, uh, and so on, and can become uh, quite dangerous. So the tendency in the uh, Kokopoulos' clinic in Rome and in uh, Tondo's clinic in Sardinia is to go easy on the antidepressants in people who are at all showing signs of upness. Uh, down, 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 fine. Antidepressants are used and used vigorously. But in people who are angry, irritable, restless, sleepless, mouthy, argumentative, uh, you know, agitated, be very, very careful with the antidepressants. Now, the data that we found here in, in panel D, I have to confess, this is not rocket science. This is not randomized, double-blind, blah, blah, blah. This is good heads-up clinical practice, and it's a snapshot of what goes on in the uh, Tondo Clinic in Sardinia. And the first thing you, you find is there's a lot of mood stabilizer use being given to people with mixed conditions, uh, three and a half times more than non-mixed. Uh, adding antipsychotics or mood stabilizers to an antidepressant much more common uh, antipsychotics, uh, two and a half times more likely to be given to somebody with mixed states than otherwise. And then the most interesting finding is a significantly lesser use of antidepressants in persons with mixed states, which is, you know, it's the party line there, it's what you'd expect. These findings actually hold up uh, in both bipolar and unipolar. If you're going to insist on a DSM view of the world. So I think these are fairly interesting findings. They're robust. Uh, they're, uh, they need to be replicated by, uh, in other samples. But they, they begin to tell a very complex story. Th these are a couple of multivariable logistic regression models. And it just highlights the factors that hold up uh, even when you throw multiple factors into a model. So uh, more commonly mixed in bipolar disorder, more substance abuse, more mixed episodes repeating, uh, more elements of depression in people who are manic or hypomanic, more uh, likely 
manic or hypomanic recurrence or first episodes. Family history uh, contains a lot of bipolarity, uh, a little bit more in women than men and more suicide. And then the story with the treatment again holds up uh, even when you put all the data into the same, same model. Now, yeah, I, there are a couple of, of, of points here that I wanted to really emphasize. And this is a recent study, and I wanted to, to try to find something uh, from another set of uh, data, not, not our own, to, to try to make the point that we may be biased, but uh, we do look at other people's literature from time to time. This is a very nice study from a uh, large uh, collection of um, uh, patients, bipolar disorder, half of them bipolar one, half bipolar two, in Finland who were followed clinically over five years, and they looked at risk of suicide attempts. And the most striking predictor of suicide risk is having mixed states. So if you take uh, people who, when they are euthymic, uh, there's a non-zero risk of suicide attempt. You know, they have bipolar disorder, after all. But it's a small number. But if they have depressive symptoms, the risk goes up by 12-fold. If they have uh, a major depressive episode, the risk goes up again, up to maybe 60-fold. But if they are in a mixed state, particularly a depressive mixed state or an agitated depression, the risk goes up over 130-fold. This is a, not a small potato. This is a very scary finding. It's another reason, by the way, that most people who deal with people in mixed states are very cautious about giving antidepressants. As I think that given irritability and hyperactivity and plus dysphoria and depression, uh, an antidepressant in that setting can really push somebody to really desperate and dangerous uh, behavior. Now, <clears throat> the story about uh, therapeutics uh, is only just beginning. And what the world needs now is to take specific and agreed on definitions of what a mixed uh, condition is, mixed mania, mixed depression, and, and, and treat them in large groups randomly, prospectively, blah, blah, blah. It has not been done yet. There are beginnings of evidence coming out about some treatments. It turns out these days that the modern antipsychotic drugs are the Cinderella uh, uh, treatments of the age. And uh, second, second generation antipsychotics are popping up everywhere. They're being used for everything for sleep, for anxiety, for psychosis, for mania, for depression, for, you know, they're just being used a lot. So it's not surprising with this nose of the camel under the tent that there is a beginnings of a literature on controlled trials of second generation antipsychotics in bipolar depression with mixed features. And there's a study with zeprazidone, olanzapine, two studies, uh, a centipede, one study, loracidone, one study, and you put it all together in this nice review from a couple of years ago, and you get a big effect. It looks like there's a real benefit uh, of treating mixed states in bipolar depression uh, with modern antipsychotics. Well, it's encouraging. It looks good. Let me tell you a bit of bad news that I'm beginning to get worried about. <clears throat> some, some years ago, I spent a lot of time uh, with John Cole and other people uh, in the department, worrying a lot about tardive dyskinesia. There, there was a time back in the uh, 80s and early 90s when tardive dyskinesia was at the very top of my hit list as, you know, public enemy uh, clinical problem number one. With the advent of the modern drugs, we don't see as much of it. It's still around. It's not zero, but much less than we used to see with drugs like aloperidol and uh, some of the other potent old-fashioned drugs. I have to tell you a story out of school that I heard last summer from a former postdoc who's now a retiring, can you believe it, professor of neurology uh, in Boston, Daniel Tarsi, was at a movement disorders meeting in Vancouver, and they were at l uh, lunch one day, and they start, the conversation turned to tardive dyskinesia. And Dan and I have done a lot of work on it over the years. And everybody at the table, these are neurologists who specialize in movement disorders, 
confess to each other, I'm seeing more of it than I ever did before. And there were some surprise expressed, and people said, but the literature says that the risk of TD with modern antipsychotics is very low. Yeah, that's true. But what if the market begins to expand by tenfold, a hundredfold? Then even if the risk is only 1% or one-tenth of 1% with the modern drugs compared to the older drugs, if the usage and exposure goes up by a hundredfold, a thousandfold, which is what's happening, then you're probably going to start seeing it again. So I don't know what this means. I'm just throwing it out as a, uh, an interesting sidewalk uh, observation. There we go. Yeah, I think this is actually, this is the last one, I think. Yeah. I, I want to try to end by laying on you a, an idea that you may or may not feel comfortable to swallow. And it's the idea that mixed conditions are, for me, becoming, beginning to look almost like a separate disorder. At least, let, let me be a little more political and say perhaps a sub-syndrome, some kind of a subtype. And it isn't just a phenomenon that happens in a fluky way from time to time, that somebody in a depressive episode uh, has some down feelings or somebody in an up episode has some uh, down feelings and so on. It's not like that. It, it begins to look like there's some cohesion to it, that it happens over and over again in the same persons, that it carries a number of very interesting clinical and perhaps biologically suggestive things that go with it, like family history of bipolar disorder, family history of suicide, early onset, and this tendency to repeat and repeat within the same person over time. Uh, in those with bipolar disorder who switch from depression to mania or hypomania, they tend to do it into mixed states. So my point about all this is not that this should be some kind of a, a pointy-headed academic exercise to obsess over but rather that I think it has some clinical importance. And I think what it means is that if you find somebody who is presenting in what DSM-5 is calling a mixed, uh, a, a depression or a mania with mixed features, that you need to take it seriously. You need to be extremely careful about giving that kind of person an antidepressant. You might want to think about some soothing type alternatives, anticonvulsants, lithium, and a psychotic drugs, perhaps, uh, at least with an antidepressant if you must, uh, if you feel you must use an antidepressant. Um, the other part of it is that you need to make some notes in the chart. I got to keep my eye on this person in a different way over time because they're more likely to get into trouble. They're more likely to spend time being sick. They're more likely to get into substance abuse. And they are way more likely to think about suicide. So this is a, a, a group of people, and I mean, even if what I'm telling you is a complete fantasy, I think from a clinical perspective, I, I recommend looking on these folks as if they have a syndrome or a sub-syndrome, need to be handled and thought about and prognosticated about and treated a bit differently from the garden variety depressed dramatic patient. And I think that's enough for one day. Questions? Arguments? <laughs> Dr. Bodkin. Oh you're, oh, you're on your feet, so we have to pay attention. Okay. Is, okay. is this on? Okay. Ross, thank you for a very uh, stimulating talk. Okay, can you, yeah, okay, so, um, two, two questions. First, um, are there any biomarkers uh, that might differentiate this syndrome that you've outlined here? And second of all, you know, uh, uh, no. Um, but then just, go ahead. And, and the second question is, you know, uh, in my own clinical work, um, I see a group of people who are depressed and kind of agitated, very ruminative, very anxious. 
uh, they don't feel particularly mixed to me, but there's another group where there's this pressure and, and a lot of the features that you've described. So do you have any uh, sense of how one, whether the, there are actually two groups, and if so, would you differentiate them? Yeah, it may be. It, re it reminds me of a, uh, there's a paper that appeared in the, uh, what we used to call the archives uh, very recently. And there was a huge survey of modern depression. And in it, they made two very interesting points. One was that in modern depression, unipolar, they said mixed features were found at 15.5%, which is similar to what we were saying. The more interesting thing was that anxious features were found in nearly 70%, which I think is speaking to your, your group. My, my tongue-in-cheek comment about that is who says that anxiety is a feature to be added on top of major depression? I mean, when I went to school, it was part of the syndrome. And I, I don't know whether it needs to be thought of as a separate group. Your, your question about biological markers is a terrific one, and I think over the next few years, if people continue to be serious, Yes. Yeah, Ross. Ross, hi. Oh, thank you. Where does lithium fit into this picture? Oh, it fits How very, come very you, it, it wasn't included in the lower right-hand corner, unless you were including it in a mood stabilizer? And where does it fit into decreasing suicidality in these high-risk patients with mixed states? Uh, you know how to raise a lot of sensitive questions all at one time. <laughs> I, I can tell you that in the uh, European clinics where we've collaborated, uh, lithium continues to be uh, pretty much treatment of choice for bipolar patients. And it is used in these, uh, in people like this who are sort of ambiguous, who, who may seem to be nominally depressed but may have a lot of agitation or manic uh, features. Lithium is used as well. And I think that the work is yet to be done as to whether lithium, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics are the optimal choice. We, we don't know that. I mean, most of what we know is purely anecdotal and street talk. It's not based on, on studies. Go. So is this on? Yes. So, so, you know, the, uh, in the olden days, without all of this data, the, the way that we were taught to differentiate agitated depression from what's now called mixed states, used to be dysphoric mania, which seemed like a more plausible term, you looked at the course of illness. And if you got someone who was basically well or maybe a little obsessional until they were 52 or something, and then they developed a straightforward, classic, melancholic depression, and in that context, they got more and more anxious and agitated because they're fretting over their right. career, their marriage, and such a person did very well on imipramine, just plain and simple. Whereas if somebody who's been ill since they were 17, and maybe they've had, if it smells like bipolar illness, it comes from a fan with bipolar illness, and then should, there's a dysphoric state, but it's an excited dysphoric state, well, you wouldn't treat that with an antidepressant. But the notion that you would rarely use an antidepressant for an agitated depression of the really sort of classic course of illness kind seems like that's, that is potentially a loss for the patient who needs I, I, their depression I, treated. I hear what you're saying, and I remember those halcyon days, too. <clears throat> and in my experience, more often, it didn't go very well. <clears throat> and a lot of those people ended up getting an antipsychotic drug on top of an antidepressant or went all the way to ECT, especially the older group, you know, middle age and beyond. Let me tell you another thing that I, I didn't really get into because it's another politically loaded issue. Uh, you seem very comfortable with the concept of agitated depression. I am too. Kokopoulos was. DSM ain't. That's a defect. Well, I, I would say that, but it's interesting that they, they don't like it because agitation can occur across the board at anything. And they argue it's nonspecific, so don't go there. We'll see. This is a political battle that'll go on for a while, I think. Oh, thank you, Ross. Frank. As usual, wonderful lecture. So I fully agree with uh, 
about Kenya with you about, you know, if people are presenting depressed, but they are irritable and agitated, especially if so like uh, the old uh, grumpy man, the stereotype, yeah. I think he's the depressant that has go first. Because to me, it's mainly the depression, but the, the irritable streak. So your argument is go full speed ahead with the antidepressant torpedoes. First. Don't worry about people blowing up on you or doing bad things. Yeah. Okay. But it's tricky when people are younger. Very tricky. Yeah. What is, uh, the, because as we know, many bipolar present with depression. Yeah. He has that depression that's... Uh, very often, uh, either very melancholic, I find the bipolar who start, yeah. or very agitated. Yeah. So I say when people are younger, really, that's the deal when you have to try to see, the f dig into familiarity, dig into anything, because we'd be ashamed to treat a major depression young with all the rest of the meds when a, an antidepressant alone will do it but also will be a shame to miss a bipolar patient that uh, you can prevent uh, the worsening of the bipolar. So, not easy. I think a couple of comments. One is that I, I, what I hope to have accomplished today was to get people thinking more open-mindedly and more differentiatingly about you know, an unhappy person walks into the office. What's wrong with them? That kind of thing. And I have to tell you as well, I worry about this more and more every year as we train younger and younger generations of folks who have this idea that within 20 minutes with a checklist, I can size somebody up and know for sure what ails them and how to treat them. I think that uh, some of the old Let's wait a while, look around, take a family history, dig in to the past history in some detail, blah, blah, blah. Hard to do these days. It takes time. But I think it's important. Yeah. We, we, we try. Yeah. I think the other general point that I would make is that if, you know, I don't, I don't disagree with you, Anelik, about the problem of the, the middle-aged or older person with a melancholic illness may do okay with an antidepressant alone. Sure. What I'm trying to get across, though, is if young, old, or in between, you use an antidepressant and things are not going well, you know, people are getting more irritable, more sleepless, blah, 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 begin to say, maybe I need to back off or think of doing something else. Okay. You, you know that. I think I get the last question. So how can we uh, avoid consigning people to lifelong antipsychotics, even second generations, a little guidance on that? And also, there's a lot of people who think that trileptal is really sexy. And do you think trileptal is really sexy? No. I mean, it looks good and it's easier to use, but uh, data are lacking at least in bipolar illness. Uh, what you're saying about the lifelong use of antipsychotic right. drugs, that's why I describe their use these days as the camel's nose coming under the tent. I'm, I'm a little worried about the camel when he's all the way in. And I think there's, there are risks out there that we're not paying attention to. I, I think you really need to think three times with long term, I mean short term fine for a month or two or three, but if you're going to ma try to maintain somebody on a modern antipsychotic for a long, long time, I think you have to really convince yourself that you're doing it for a good reason and, and watch them and be on the lookout for funny movements and grimacing and things like that. Anything else?